Well, right. Welcome one and all for the first SPF in Equality and Growth Colloquium series. Um, we are honored to host Dr. Krishnamurthy Venkata Subramanian uh, for a lecture on inequality and growth in India. Uh, the Sanus Popular Foundation is a student organization at Yale with a mission to offer undergraduates an avenue to engage with the many facets of international development and welfare maximizing policy formation. Uh, I would like to support the Yale Economic Growth Center for the generous support, without which this event would not have been possible. Uh, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Subramanian. Uh, Dr. Subramanian served as the 17th and youngest chief economic advisor for the government of India from 2018 to 2021. During his tenure, he instituted policies for India's macroeconomic recovery uh, to the COVID-19 crisis and employed public capital expenditures to counter cyclical fiscal policy. Dr. Subramanian is a professor at the Indian School of Business and currently serves as India's executive director at the IMF. Uh, he's also worked in expert committees for the Securities and Exchange Board of India and the Reserve Bank of India. He's a leading expert in economic policy, banking, and corporate governance, and has authored the recently published Money, a Zero Sum Game. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor Subramanian. Thank you very much. Um, I must say it's a real privilege to be here at one of the most esteemed institutions and to be among such bright and uh, young folks. Um, as, as, a, as a professor, one thing I always enjoy is getting into the classroom because the fact of being a professor, you age every year, but the incoming cohort remains as young. Um, and so you can actually draw on their energy. Uh, and I think it's fantastic to be here among young uh, people like, like you um, and being able to share some of my thoughts. So um, what I'm going to speak upon uh, is something that I think is very relevant, um, of course, in the global context, but um, even in the you know, in the uh, Indian context. Um, so I'm going to speak on, based on a chapter um, that was written in the uh, 2021 economic survey that I had authored, um, which with the same title, uh, Growth and Inequality, Conflict or Convergence. Um, that was the, so uh, let me start, uh, you know, directly by motivating why I think this is quite important to study. Um, the 2020 economic survey that I wrote, many of you, um, you know, might have uh, taken a look at it. Uh, Bilal was mentioning, you know, about him having read it. Uh, some of you others may have also have read it. Um, was um, considered by many as, as you know, uh, an important um, change in the way uh, policy was thought you know, thought about for India, given India's socialist past. Um, thinking about wealth and wealth creation as the way for you know for prosperity. In India, you know, was uh, was was recognized as a very important, you know, change in economic policy, um, and you know, the basic idea that that uh, of course there were many different arms to it. You know, a full uh, survey comprised of eleven chapters in the volume one, uh, you know, uh, uh, really sort of built this idea. But but the basic idea was you know marrying the invisible hand of markets language that you know all of us are are familiar with. Uh, Adam Smith coined it. Uh, but marrying it with the hand of ethics, you know, um, and and that is basically the way for 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 ethical wealth creation and thereby prosperity in India. Uh, but the uh, oft often repeated concern from this is basically, you know, what about inequality? You know, yes, wealth creation, you know, and and growth is absolutely fine, but you know, we have to worry about about inequality and you know, uh, sort of equity in society. Um, uh, commentary, especially in you know uh, um, in in advanced economies, in schools like these, universities like these, actually you know worries about uh, you know is it the fact that you know uh, uh, inequality is a necessary outcome of you know of, of capitalism itself? Um, you know is that something that is inevitable? Is um, is a question that is being that is asked? And you know especially after the global financial crisis, it gets asked. Um, you know, if you think about the Occupy Wall Street, um, you know, kind of, uh, um, I was, you know, my, 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 my daughter is in her senior year at the University of Chicago, and, you know, uh, when I was visiting uh, her, I was seeing many signs on the, you know, where, where she stays, and, you know, signs that I actually never read when I was doing, you know, when I was myself at the University of Chicago, you know, uh, uh, the supposed temple of capitalism, but the slo slogans that I now read actually have so much of a socialist flavor to them. Um, and I was wondering, is there something that has changed, you know, in university campuses that um, as a result, you know, uh, um, 
you know, is, is inequality being taken as a necessary outcome of capitalism? So, in some sense, this conflict between growth and and inequality that we seem to be taking for granted, you know, in in the in the in the advanced economies, and you know. Um, I had the opportunity to think about this issue, especially during COVID. The 2021 economic survey came during the time of COVID, and everybody was talking about inequality, you know, at that time. And that's why, you know, that was the context for this. Uh, um, so um, the question basically is: it that you know, growth and you know, growth and uh, um, inequality have to be necessarily in conflict? Um, you know, maybe that is the case in advanced economies, but can we just extrapolate on from there? You know, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure you read Thomas Piketty's work. Um, but but is it necessary that the same you know sort of conflict has to obtain for every other economy? That's the question uh, you know we asked. Um, so if you look at you know uh, China and and India as well, China far, you know far more than India. Um, the kind of poverty reduction that has happened over three decades actually is unprecedented. Um, you know uh, even in India as well since 1991, just growth has actually delivered so much you know prosperity and has reduced poverty a lot. You know the reduction. Poverty reduction has, has 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 happened. So you know these two countries do then challenge this notion that maybe there isn't you know this conflict. Maybe you know uh, um, there may be some convergence, and that is why uh, you know so so that is what we set out to actually you know sort of examine. Uh, um, you know, could the fact that the absolute levels of poverty itself in these countries, you know, these are large populations, you know, um, and, and India especially, you know, uh, there isn't another you know. Uh, um, Sort of uh, country in this, in, you know, in the world with a 1.4 billion population and a democracy, um, you know, um, and so in a democracy, so many narratives can prevail at the same time, and you know, that's a, that's a you know wonderful aspect of a democracy. Uh, but could it be the case that you know the absolute levels of poverty that prevail and the potential to grow at a very high rate mean that maybe growth and inequality may not be in conflict in these, you know, in in India? And that's sort of what what set us to go and you know. Uh, uh, um, so uh, could it be that high levels of economic growth basically uh, you know and and uh, and the high levels of poverty can avoid this conflict that was the um, as, as i said question became absolutely salient post the pandemic but even before this is something which actually has remained relevant you know before 1991 you know india pursued socialist policies um, uh, you know that that uh, that i actually like thinking it distributed poverty equally and evenly to everybody um, you know uh, um, and, and now, despite abandoning socialism post 1991, you know the intellectual remnants of of these socialist era policies still persist, um, and therefore, you know, um, the the, the trade-off between distribution versus expanding the pie is something that is you know relevant even it was relevant even before before COVID. Um, so so that that's basically the motivation for you know for, for for writing this chapter. What I'm going to show you is you know bunch of evidence. Um, where I'm going to compare, you know, what we see in India um, versus what 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 we see in the advanced economies, um, and I'm going to focus on socio-economic indicators basically because the you know um, the existing literature for the advanced economies basically says you know using these socio-economic indicators says that you know uh, while um, you know uh, growth, which basically is, is reflected in GDP per capita, you know enhances uh, uh, socio-economic indicators. But inequality actually, you know, when there's greater inequality, that exacerbates and actually dampens these. Uh, so, in other words, therefore, growth and inequality are in conflict, you know, for the advanced economies. So, the question is, let's go and examine the same thing for 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 India, and that's basically what what the first part of my talk is going to be about, you know. Um, so, let me. Uh, so, I'm going to show you a series of charts. These are all, you know, uh, you can you can draw them, you can find them in the economic survey chapter. Uh, and just, uh, you know, that's the source for all of this. Um, the, uh, the the pattern for these charts will be very similar. Uh, I'll have you know a measure of inequality on the x-axis on the left panel. Um, I'll have you know um, basically GDP per capita. You know, in the case of states, this is variation among Indian states that I'm going to use. Um, so you know, the national state domestic product per capita I'll have on the x-axis on the right panel. The top panel will be for Indian states. And then the bottom panel will be for advanced economies. You know, so the, what we are basically doing in the, in the bottom panel is just replicating what ha, what the literature has already talked about for you know for advanced economies. What we are doing new is or what we did new in the economic survey was look at the same thing for Indian states. So I want to spend you know some time on the first chart, and then you know I think the rest of it will basically be similar, right? So uh, 
and what you see on the y axis will be so i'll show you different kinds of outcomes i'll show you first health some education outcomes crime you know you know um, uh, uh, mortality rate fertility rate you know all the different kind of you know social drug abuse you know so the y variable will keep changing the x variable will remain the same the pattern will be the same top will be basically for indian states bottom will be for advanced economies so i want you to now pay careful attention here these are by the way just correlations you know there is no causality that is being interpreted here pure pure correlations um, but i think there is still quite a lot of you know there's a, there's, a, there's a story in there just from from the correlations itself um, so take a look first for the advanced economies you know i'll come to the indian states because that's new let's know what is what is out there and then look at the look at the new stuff so what do you see here you know when you if you focus on this particular chart as the, the you know national income per capita increases your you know health outcomes become better that's what this this chart is basically showing um, you know as you can see worse and better is basically being clearly shown here so you know improvement in you know in, in income per capita which happens through growth of course economic growth seems to actually be positively correlated with health indicators so you know higher income better health outcomes that's basically what you can interpret you know again i i'm not saying that higher income causes you know um, better health outcomes because could, the direction of causality could be the other way as well you know better health outcomes you know, better human capital can lead to you know higher income per capita i must emphasize these are pure correlations no causal interpretation here at all uh, but i think the correlations are in and itself quite interesting as well so a positive correlation here between health outcomes and income per capita which is in other words positive growth seems to be be positively correlated with health health outcomes what do you see with inequality you see exactly the opposite you basically see higher inequality worse the health outcomes you know and and this is basically what i said this conflict between you know between uh, uh, growth and inequality in advanced economies right now the question is do, will we you know when, and and i must admit actually when we set out writing this chapter we had no clue whether we will obtain what we actually obtained you know it could have been the same we could have obtained the same thing as for advanced economies or it, we could have obtained what we actually you know what i'm going to talk about notice here that this is this this is clearly in conflict but when you look at for indian states um, and here this is here variation is across countries is being shown there is variation across states um, so as with the you know as with with growth you see a positive correlation of you know national uh, state domestic product per capita so you know growth at the state level actually inc increases the state domestic per you know product per capita a positive correlation but and this is where the difference is even with gini you know a, a proxy for inequality you see the same you know positive correlation so the first sort of you know in some sense the first uh, uh, um, evidence that you see this conflict for the advanced economies between you know between growth and inequality but there is no doesn't seem to be there's a conflict you know the correlation is going the same way for you know for inequality and for and 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 for growth you know for india okay so this is what i showed you with health outcomes i hope you know you have understood this first chart because the rest of it just keep looking at the you know the direction of the correlation you know just is the line sloping down or is the line sloping up if the line is sloping up it's a positive correlation if the line is sloping down it is basically a negative correlation i'm sure you know that is something that all of you would agree with right so just i'm going to show you different outcomes keep focusing on what you'll find is across all these plethora of indicators you'll see positive basically a line sloping up for all the you know, the two panels on the top and the one that you actually have on the bottom right and you'll see a you know a line sloping down for basically the you know the one that is on the bottom bottom left which is you know, which is what that's the for the for the advanced economy so next one i'm going to show you is for education outcomes um and you know same way you see basically positive correlation you know with uh, with education outcomes for um, you know for, for for indian states uh, what we saw for health outcomes in advanced economies same thing for you know for uh, uh, with, with education outcomes for advanced economies then let's go and look at this is life expectancy another important you know uh, indicator same thing basically for you know here you see uh, there, here there's no no correlation uh, you know with, with with life expectancy negative correlation with you know with with income inequality same kind of correlation with uh, you know uh, for the states so again you know that this this difference that you're seeing 
you know, growth versus inequality for the advanced economies, none of that difference for, 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 for you know, Indian states. Next one, infant mortality. You know, again, you see basically uh, you know, a, a, a difference here, positive sloping line, negative sloping line there, both negative sloping line for. So I've shown you health outcomes, I've shown you education outcomes, I've shown you life expectancy, I've shown you now infant mortality rate. Next I'm going to show you is this is crime, you know, violent crime measured using murder rate. Another important socioeconomic indicator. Again, the same thing. Here you again see basically conflict. You see, you know, uh, uh, no, no, no such conflict with for, for Indian states. Then you come to basically drug abuse. You know, drug abuse here actually not much correlation at all. You know, for for the advanced economies with income. Um, same way, you know, for India actually neither 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 inequality nor you know uh, in uh, nor growth seems to have any correlation with drug abuse. But you know, inequality in the advanced economies does seem to have a very strong correlation with, with, with drug abuse. Again, something that inequality seems to actually, higher inequality correlates with, with greater drug, drug abuse. None of that actually, no correlation, but it's the same no correlation with both growth and with, and with inequality as well. Um, you know, for, uh, then if you look at this is next is mental health. Um, again, another important socioeconomic indicator. And here you basically see, you know, uh, that, that in this case, there isn't, for mental illness, there doesn't seem to be that conflict. The only me metric, you know, for advanced economies, there doesn't seem to be a conflict. But even there, for India, again, there is no, no conflict. So when you see, so this is across basically a bunch of, I think that's my, uh, yeah, I'm going to show you a few where, for which we couldn't obtain data from, you know, for the advanced economies. So I'm going to show you only for the Indian states. Next is birth rate. Again, you see the same, um, another important socioeconomic indicator. Um, Next, you see, um, sorry, this one actually has, uh, okay, I think that's fine, let me just go ahead and see. Bilal, can you just help me here? So this one, for some reason, actually is not, you know, but total fertility rate, that's what you, what you can't see there is the total fertility rate, same thing there. And then you look at death rate, you know, again, again, the same thing. So, uh, yeah, let me, let me just, you know, uh, sort of summarize this and then I'll come to, um, so no correlation here with death rate. So uh, just to sort of, you know, uh, um, so what all have I shown you? you know, I, sh I started with basically health, health outcomes. Um, this. Um, sort of conflict for advanced economies, none of that for Indian states. I showed you education outcomes. I showed you then life expectancy. Then I showed you infant mortality. Uh, then murder, which is basically violent crime, proxy for violent crime. Then, you know, uh, drug abuse. Um, and then uh, 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 mental health. Uh, then birth rates, uh, total fertility rate, and the death rate. And across each one of these outcomes, you know, these are sort of a, a, a range of socioeconomic indicators. What we observe is for the Indian states, there is the correlation is basically the same between, you know, income per capita and that particular socioeconomic indicator and, you know, um, uh, um, and, and, and inequality and the socioeconomic indicator. So there is the conflict that we basically have seen you know, with advanced economies, at least in the data, does not seem to be the case with, um, so that's sort of the, uh, let me just, you know, I'll, I'll finish this slide and then I'll come to your question. Um, so in India, the sign of correlation of socioeconomic indicators with growth and equality seem to be the same. Um, in contrast, in advanced economies, the sign of that correlation is basically with growth are opposite to that of inequality. Um, across a plethora of socioeconomic indicators, um, so while growth and inequality seem to be in you know, conflict in advanced economies, that does not seem to be the case you know, in, in India using these socioeconomic indicators as, as proxies for you know, things that we would care about basically from a, you know, a, a sort of a welfare perspective. Um, now, I, I'll come to this part actually saying one of the questions that will be in your mind is, you know, is are these just being up, obtained for the particular measure of inequality I've used? I use basically inequality measured as a Gini coefficient. This is consumption inequality. You know, is this robust? You know, is this, have you sort of, you know, have you gone and mined the data to actually just find what you, you know, 
Uh, turns out, no, that is not the case. We actually, you know, if, if I, I'll show you later. As I said, you know, we did not go in, you know, in, into this chapter with any prior. You know, we basically wanted to examine what was the, uh, even when you go and look at it with asset inequality, for instance, consumption, same thing is obtained. Now I can actually, let, let me take the question. I guess just a clarification, are you arguing that more inequality makes people healthier, makes them more educated? No, so actually see that would be a causal statement, right? right. I actually am not arguing, and that is why I'm, you know, I've said it twice, that uh, I am not making a causal statement at all. You know, I don't think that it would be correct to say that more inequality causes you know, better, better indicators. It's a pure correlation, right? It could be the case, you know, there could be a bunch of other factors that are maybe lead, leading to both, you know, uh, the, the, the better socio-economic indicator and higher inequality as well. That could be one thing that's going on. Or it could be the case that maybe the higher, you know, the higher socio-economic indicator is maybe a reflection of inequality. Any one of that could be going on. I do not want to make any causal statements here at all because that is that is treacherous here in this particular, you know, in, in the in, in, in this in this territory. Uh, because you know, and and it's very hard to pin that down. Actually, the causal, you know, in, in in pure research. So I I think that would. It's not just a leap of faith. It is basically like you know going up, you know, Mount Everest, you know, from from ground. That's kind of um, so no causal causal statement at all. Yeah. Uh, just so I get you right, you're saying that states like in inequality states, which are for example like a Kerala, a Goa in India, you're saying they have the least amount of education or mortality rate. No, like no, that. no, no, actually. Because so they are correlated, right? Yes. So here's so the, the thing, nice right? So inequality. Yes. Goa, Kerala, right? So and, uh, Goa, Kerala, all of these are in here. Now the, the So what is each dot then? Each dot is a state. Right, but if each dot is a state, then they have the lowest. Not I think the key point to note here is basically there are there may be some outliers. What we are capturing here yeah. is basically averages. That is why you have to be always careful, you know, to make sure that you don't use a sample point to infer these things, you know, because that could be subject to small sample bias. What you are interested in here is across all the states in India, what is the average pattern that you are observing? That's that's what you know that line of fit that I showed you across all of these. So these are basically. So I, I think that, that that means I should clarify this, right? These points here are all countries, you know, the bottom panels. So you know, top ones are all states. And if you if it is the case that each one of the state fits, you know, basically that pattern, you will find all those dots lining up on the line itself. There wouldn't be a single, you know, but that is never the case. I have never seen a, you know, a, 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 a data, you know, a scatter plot that just lines up, you know. If I see that, I'm very suspicious. Is the data being constructed? Has it been played around with? Actually, in the real world, you never, you know, you know, obtain that kind of thing. So, uh, I, I don't think you actually want to infer anything about a particular state itself. I am asking this question for India, and saying that, you know, yes, it's a, with the same outlier phenomenon, etc. as well. Some country could be an outlier here as well. You know, with the same thing, am I finding the same correlation that you see in the advanced economies? Do you see the same correlation by using variation across across Indian states? Is that, That's a simple question I'm asking. And I'm not, you know, as I, uh, I think good that, you know, what's your name? Himanesh. H Himanush? Himanush. Himanush. So the question that Himanush has actually is very good clarification because you do not want to say anything causal here, you know. Uh, so uh, it'll be it'll be so stupid to say, right, that based on this, that oh, increase inequality or you know, social economic. No, absolutely not. You know that that is basically a it's a causal leap from just what is something just a pure co correlation. So I, I think that l let's be very careful about. Uh, yeah. Um, a couple of questions actually. Yeah. I think both of us have have thought of the same thing at once. Yeah. Um, in both of these cases, because you're taking states and, and uh, countries as, as your data points, yeah. do you have a concern that maybe the you know the vastly different size mm -hmm. of each data point is sort of mangling the data a little bit? Like if we have a tiny rich state like a Goa or a Sikkim, is that going to warp it compared to 100 million Bihar? No, so so that, that the same Or a problem, Denmark versus US sort of. No, but the same problem actually is there with, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with countries as well, right? You have, you have a, you know, um, maybe a, a US there. You also have maybe a you know a, a, a low income country too. Yeah. So it, it's it, as long as actually the same problem is there on both sides. I'm doing an apples to apples comparison. Okay. 
Uh, and a, another question I just had is, I mean, you've done this across geographies in both cases. Have you also had the chance to look at some sort of intertemporal data, like sort of through the years? How does how does health outcome change? I'll, I'll, I'll show you some. I'll show you some. This is basically so this data, you know, and you can refer to the economic survey chapter. The details are all in there. Okay. So this is using the 2011 consumption survey. Uh, uh, we also, you know, in the survey chapter, we also see is this just a point in time? Or is this something that is more robust? Yeah. You know, so there's a bunch of robustness that is there in the chapter. Yeah. I may not have time to show you all that because I want to co cover more ground. Um, but it's there in the chapter. Okay. So that makes sense. Chapter four of the 2021 economic survey. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, any other question? Yeah. Uh, since we are comparing the India with advanced economies and we are seeing this like different time, type of correlations, can we say that like there is a threshold for the growth? After that, this this growth and inequality are in conflict. So see, if if there was a threshold, you would have seen. I you know we basically did try to, you know, put non-linear fits as well here. So if you do a, for instance, a polynomial fit or a quadratic fit, what would you see if it is basically a threshold? It's like one kind of threshold would be like a hockey stick kind of payoff, right? Which is it's flat up until a certain threshold maybe, and then it basically increases after the threshold. That's one way. Or it could be flat up until, and then it falls. Or maybe it is basically falls and then it's flat. But there has to be some non-linearity. It doesn't look like there is, you know, um, at least in the data, whether it is for the advanced economies, nor it is, is it for, uh, so I'm not quite sure the data seems to have a, a threshold like that. Maybe we can look into like middle income countries and see whether what kind of relations they have. You could, but I think, you know, see, if you, the, the worry sometimes is if you beat up the data you know, enough and zoom in too much, you may actually find the pattern that you're looking for. But you have to be a little careful because, you know, I mean, what is a middle income country today may actually be, may have been a low income country earlier. So you have to be, I think, you know, uh, that's some of the discipline that you have to maintain as a, as a, as a researcher. So that, uh, because there's always a tendency to go and find what you, your priors are, you know, that's, I, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that, 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 go that direction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to come. I'm okay. going to show you, actually. In fact, that's... Uh, so, but, but this this part of the exercise was just to actually sort of, you know, come to this this sort of conclusion that, you know, because I'll tell you why why I set out to write this. Because in general, you know, when I was, you know, and if you... I'll, I'll talk about it later. There is a lot of tendency, you know, in, in, in emerging economies to say the advanced economies know it all and, you know, they figure it all. And so whatever they do, just cut paste, basically, you know, uh, and, and just put it for, you know, do it for, 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 for India, you know. Oh, we don't need to apply our own brains, you know. They figure it out, basically, let them do all the thinking work. We will basically just go and, you know, cut paste it on too. Which is something that, you know, as it turned out, for in COVID, I'll talk about it later, we explicitly, you know, uh, um, you know avoided that. India was the only country which actually, you know, implemented supply-side policies. We did not do the kind of, you know, printing like there's no tomorrow that the advanced economies did. And I was, you know, uh, part of that because I, I really, really sort of don't like this cut-paste business that goes on in, you know, thinking that somebody has figured it out and, you know, that we shouldn't be applying our own brains, brains to think about what is right for India. So uh, the, the, the worry for me was if it is the case that growth and inequality are so much in conflict and that people have brought, you know, read Tom Thomas Piketty, and therefore, you know, what Thomas Piketty says for the advanced economies, we should be doing the same, thinking about the same kind of trade-offs for India, you know, and just extrapolate. I think that is not something that we should be very careful about, that kind of cut-paste. And that was one of the important messages that I actually wanted to, you know, to, to, to deliver, uh, you know, as part of, uh, through this. Because the economic survey actually guides policy, at, at least the ones that I wrote actually, you know, had a, had a significant impact, on, impact on, on policy and therefore, you know, wanted to make sure that, you know, the right objectives were being set for policy. Um, so this is uh, related actually, as, so the green line you see is basically, you know, um, the, the, I think that's a 45 degree line. This is a correlation between the, yeah, that's a correlation between uh, Gini based on assets and Gini based on consumption. So, which is again basically showing that they're sort of, you know, similar, not very, not very different. Um, all these charts, we did not put it in the chapter, but we actually did, we replaced these charts with, you know, uh, with uh, Gini based on assets and you get the same thing. So it's, you know, pretty, pretty robust. It's not just based on some measures. Uh, 
Okay, now this is so this is you know, speaking to the question that you asked me here. Um, so if you look at India, and I'm going to show you, this is where some of the time series stuff I'm going to show you, you know, as well. So if you look at the at you know measures for for poverty, right? Um, and the headcount ratio is basically one of the you know, headcount of poverty. Um, and you know you basically so you have uh, um, growth on the on the left panel. You have inequality on the on the right panel. Um, now what you see is actually there's such a strong negative correlation between growth and 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 poverty, which is so. so and you know there is actually a lot of work. Not in this, not in in this particular chapter, but elsewhere, showing that grow, you know, growth indeed has a causal impact on on reducing poverty. In other words, you know, higher growth does lead to lower poverty, and that is a causal statement, which is actually you know there's a lot of literature that you know that that shows that. And what you are finding here for India is actually consistent. The correlation you're finding is consistent with that you know with with that uh, 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 that literature. But when you look at it with with Gini coefficients, inequality, for instance. There seems to be hardly any correlation between poverty reduction and, 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 and inequality. In other words, now apart from the fact that you know in India the this conflict that, that you know you see in advanced economies does not seem it seem to be obtained, it is the case that it is actually you know in growth that is really leading to the maximum poverty reduction. And therefore, at this point in time, I'm actually comfortable saying that at the stage of development that India is in, India must be focusing on growth a lot more. And you know, and when it comes to actually the trade-off between, let's say, policies that enhance growth versus policies that basically, you know, let's say, work on inequality, you know, the focus should be on on growth uh, because that is what re really brings down absolute poverty. Uh, so now here's where actually I want to, you know, uh, having shown you some evidence, now I want to, you know, frame inequality in, you know, in the in uh, just thinking about inequality, a lot of us, when we are young, we actually care about these things, and you know, sometimes you know, you have to think through carefully. You know, so I'm going to relate. Uh, uh, I don't know how many of you, at least those of you who are from India, you know, would. There was this uh, television show that was called Malgudi Days. Um, so you know, there is this character there actually. Uh, for those for, for for those of you who are not from India, there's a it's a character where basically there's a sort of like a <coughs> a kid that is about that would be about 10 year old um, you know who's the who's the main protagonist of that particular television show when we were kids you we used to watch that so you know in a particular episode and i remember that very well this character his name was swami you know swami was the was the, was the name of that um, so this 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 kid basically comes you know running through from from school running to his mother saying um, that um, uh, you know Amma, it's, it's, it's actually set in South India, and that's why he says, Amma, he says, you know, Amma, I actually got 100 out of 100 in, my, in maths, in my examination. Um, Shankar, which is basically, he's a, he's a friend, of friend, you know, got 60 out of 100. Um, the principal basically wanted to make sure, he done, didn't like that there was, you know, inequality in our, in our outcomes. So he took 20 marks out of my, you know, uh, uh, my score, reduced it to 80 and gave that, those 20 marks to Shankar. He basically goes crying to his mother, um, and, and 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 you know that's that's one so one scene is shown this way, and then the the, the scene changes and then you know they show Shankar. Shankar is like really happy, basically going to his mother. You know, without studying anything, I actually got eighty out of a hundred. Shankar is really you know he's thrilled, and um, then the episode moves on. You know, and then now again it, it you know focuses on the character you know Swami says, you know, I'm not going to study anymore for um, for mathematics because even without studying, I can get 80 out of 100. And anyways, if I get 100 out of 100, I'm not going to get that anyway because 20 marks is going to be taken and given to, you know, given to Shankar. What's the point of me studying? Um, then the, the, the frame again moves on and then Shankar is saying that, you know, to his mom, says, anyway, mom, actually, last time also I didn't study. I got, you know, I, I without much studying, I got 60. And now, without studying anyway, I'm going to get 20 grace marks. So I have no incentive to study either. So, you know, th that's how this episode moves. The, the moral of the story is this redistribution, what it basically did was, you know, it actually dampened incentives. The guy who was working hard to get 100 out of 100, you know, had now no incentive to study hard. And the person who basically anyway didn't have the incentives, now is no, he knows very well that he's anyway, you know, get passing marks and his incentives are dulled as well. So the, the motive of the story is to actually think about the 
effects that come from you know when a lot of us actually the you know we have bleeding hearts and say oh we should basically be reducing inequality by redistribution and i'm you know i i i think some redistribution should happen especially when endowments are dif different as i just said you know uh, earlier if you happen to be win the lottery of life you actually were you know were born to the parents who actually gave you good education etc some of that should happen but when you know redistribution affects incentives perversely and there's actually a you know uh, um, you can do the experiment here that i if I, i remember reading at some point in time this experiment one of the professors did it at you know in, in one of the classes said that um, basically said you know after the exams those who gotten a grades you know i'm going to actually give you a give you a b plus those who got a c i'm going to give you a b plus as well and then by the end of the semester actually you know the a plus guy a guy who were getting a plus had no incentive to study not at the guy who's actually were you know guys or gals who are actually getting getting c's as well because all the incentive for you know the differences of you know the incentive to work hard actually completely went away so i think this is a conceptual aspect that those of us with bleeding hearts actually who don't think about the ramifications of of these should have you know definitely be aware of as well and that is something which is you know incredibly important to to and i i'm bringing this up only because as i said at the outset i saw these you know at the university of chicago campus i actually saw these slogans which actually i mean i for one uh, um, having myself studied i couldn't have imagined the university of chicago where actually such kind of slogans slogans would have been written you know uh, um, uh, but but it is important as an economist actually to think about you know what is the outcome second round effects of 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 things like this and this story that i just described i think illustrates that um, very well here oops sorry um, so uh, this is basically you know showing in us what i showed you just in that in that univariate chart you know multivariate framework taking care of much of other things you know that can impact poverty as well you know you know regression setting you actually control for you know these are what are called state effects fixed effects these are panel you know regressions you know uh, so sort of panel data econometrics that helps you to control for a lot of stuff that may be different across states so for instance you're talking about kerala may be very different from let's say you know from from uttar pradesh and you want to take care of that and you know it, this does that and shows that still you actually obtain a very strong correlation between you know between a growth and and an inequality that growth indeed does sorry growth and growth and and, and poverty that growth indeed actually reduces the reduces poverty uh, so how are we doing with time how much time do i have um, another half hour another half hour okay we have some so we can take questions so i can you know keep 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 them coming um, let me you know focus on one aspect of you know of of uh, policies to reduce inequality there are many um, you know i'll come up cover um one of the other things that's been done in india um, and the ones that i have been part of i'll talk about that later but you know what one of the key things i think is important is is credit you know credit especially credit to the you know to the right people uh, makes a difference i was on the board of bandhan bank i don't know how many of you actually you know know about this this is a microfinance institution in india that actually you know became a bank and microfinance as you know is basically you know is loans to very very you know poor people you know these are loans that are about you know 20000 rupees um which you know in um, today you know in sort of dollar terms or might be just 125 dollars you know 125 or am i getting that right no i may be uh, yeah uh, not not too much you know i i'm not doing the um uh, uh so 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 you know you can actually uh, yeah 100 dollars would be what 8000 rupees um, so yeah 250 250 about 250 dollars actually so that's what so that, that's not a large sum at all you know um, but but i've seen that and actually have gone and uh, gone to to the to the small towns and people spoken to these borrowers I was, I was on the board for almost you know uh, three years i had to quit that position when i became the ca um, but i've seen you know the impact that it creates actually on uh you know on on uh, on on real 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 life and that's why credit is actually i think very important you know in terms in introducing inequality so this is um, so it it's a plug for my my book um which speaks about exactly this 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 aspect um so the book just has has just come out um the foreword is written by the the, the finance indian finance minister and bunch of people who have been former rbi governors and policy makers actually have have been kind enough to give advance assessments of of the book um in that in this book we actually highlight something that is very important in the indian context so here 
you know, this is because it speaks to, 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 to inequality. Take a look at credit that's being given, you know, per capita credit in rural areas and urban areas. You know, the green line here is basically for, is, is rural per capita credit, and the, 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 the red one is urban per capita credit. And this is being shown over a, uh, over a 30 year period. Take a look at how, you know, uh, rural credit has actually just been, you know, anemic all through and how urban credit has basically increased, especially from 2004, 2005 onwards. Um, um, and now that has actually, you know, implications for inequality because, so, you know, many times bankers will, bankers will say that, oh, because there's no demand for, for credit in rural areas. You know, having myself worked in Bandhan Bank, I don't buy that, you know, I, I'm not persuaded by that at all because I've actually gone and, you know, when I when, when we go, used to go to these meetings, if the people would say, you know, they talk to me in Bengali, I speak Bengali, so they actually say, you know, Dada, when are you, when are you giving me the next, next uh, tranche of the loan? So there is clear demand for credit and in fact, you know, I want to ally this with, with one more fact in India. You know, um, in India, population of, of course, 1.4 billion people, one in seven people actually get credit from the formal financial system. One in seven, one in seven, you know. Um, so there, is, there are six people out of seven that basically don't get credit. And, uh, you know, they, these are people who actually can definitely, you know, grow their own income and thereby really bridge inequality as well as this is something which is therefore very important. Uh, one of the key things that actually is important from this perspective is the 450 million bank accounts for 450 million people that have been created in India. This is, you know, that 450 million is actually almost, you know, about 25% bigger, more than the population of the United States, you know, or the population of Europe. Um, and, and, and that's the amount of you know, bank accounts that have been created for the poor. Uh, since 2016, there's a ton of data. Those of you who are actually have an entrepreneurial bent, if you want to go and create, you know, sort of, uh, I, I can't think of a better opportunity than, you know, credit, fintech, using fintech, you know, in because the kind of digitization that has happened in India now, you know, you can actually go and I, I do that. You can, if you want to go and buy bananas for, let's say, a dozen bananas for 50 rupees, that's actually about 70 cents. Um, you know, you can pay even 70 cents to the fruit seller, you know, in, in you know, using Paytm or, or Google Pay. Uh, you can do that not just in a city like Hyderabad or Delhi, but you can do in many of the, you know, small towns as well. Now, what's the advantage of this? This guy who actually might have three, four years back, if he went to a bank and said, you know, I earn, you know, um, let's say, if, if he says I actually earn $500 a month, the, the banker would say, you know, where's the proof? You know, how, you, I, I don't know, I, I don't trust that you actually earn $500 a month. Now he can basically show, say, look at my, look, the, the inflows actually, I, it's all going into my bank account, look at, you know, look at the average. And that can be used to assess his ability to repay, especially if you ally it with third party data, like, you know, uh, you know phones, for instance. Is this guy disciplined in paying his prepaid bills? You know, is he paying, what? because if he's disciplined in actually paying this, that's a very good, you know, proxy for ability to repay. Um, and, and that kind of stuff can really be used to actually give credit you know, to these pe people who are poor, um, and, and at the same time, it could be a very good business proposition as well. Because the kind of digitization, and you know, this other, th other thing, very few people know, if you, you know, look at the number of digital transactions that happen in a day in India, as a comparison, take the number of digital transactions that happen in the United States, add to that the number of digital transactions that happen in Europe, add to that the number of digital transactions that happen in China, Add all of this, double it. The number of transactions that happen in a day in India are more than all of this. That's the extent of digitization. So, you know, US plus Europe plus China, double of that is basically more than that is the amount of digital transactions that happen in India. That's, these are actually facts. Um, you know, and, and, and that, so the amount of data that is being generated out of that and therefore the entrepreneurial opportunities to actually give credit and, and, and you know, and, and make money as well in the process. And I see, as I said, I, I've seen this working as a business proposition at Bandhan Bank, you know, and so FinTech, this is, you know, those of you who actually are entrepreneurial actually, can, you know, seems like a wonderful option. You have, you have a question. Yeah, I was just wondering what the um, y-axis units were for this. So the y-axis here is basically the, uh, you know, per capita credit that is, it is in, if I remember right, it is actually in hundreds, hundreds of, hundred thousand. So, you know, um, so you would see a rural, 
you know, per capita credit it actually has not increased much at all. The, uh, on average, I think the urban would be, I think it's two, 200,000 per rupees. Um, that's what the, the, the number is. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me now, you know, uh, just because growth is so important, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you uh, just in a minute, uh, Devan. Uh, I want to, you know, end my talk with giving you some perspective on growth because, as I just mentioned, growth is by far the most important for you know um, for India for for reduction of, of poverty and overall and you know the the, me the message that actually and this was the unambiguous message that I shared with the powers that be in the government that you know uh, yes there might be debate happening about inequality etc in the advanced economies for India let's just keep our you know laser like focus on growth you know do do efficient welfare using using you know uh, uh, technology uh, you know for instance especially the, the direct benefit transfers etc do that. But on the, at the macroeconomic level, just keep the focus, laser-like focus on growth. Um, and that's, the, that's, that's basically the message that, so I do want to end my talk before talking about, you know, what's, what is the prospects for growth in India? How has India done, you know, in, in COVID, um, you know, on, on the growth side and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, um, and, and thereby talk about the prospects of growth for this, for this uh, decade. Yeah, Devan? Uh, two questions about the previous graph. Uh, one is just basically for the rural data, does that capture informal credit networks um, that exist at the community or village level? So it's a purely no. banking institution. This is, this is formal credit. Okay. See, see, the problem with actually informal credit is informal credit is very costly. Sure. Costly when I say I, costly not in the monetary terms, but in non-monetary ways, very inefficient. You know, for instance, things like if you take you know these these chit funds that are used, yeah. right? Chit funds, you know, they're very costly because there are many times actually the, the chit fund who may create may run away with the money. You know things like that. So um, it, it is formal credit because formal, you know, financial system intermediates the money in a much more efficient way than informal does. So this is, and and therefore I wouldn't want to look at informal credit either. I want to look at formal credit. And the fact that the formal credit basically has grown so spectacularly for urban areas and so uh, and so abysmally for the rural areas is basically what is the point that I want to make. And then the related question about the urban level is just the doubling of digital transactions relative to sort of US, Europe, China. Is that reflective of penetration across the country or just of high concentrations of digital use in large urban areas? No, so actually the, 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 uh, that's a good question. There is a, you know, it's, it's as I said, when I'm answering, yeah. it's not just in the, you know, in the uh, you know, six or seven metro cities, actually it's, you know, in a lot of the towns as well. Um, you know, for instance, I come, you know, from a, from a small town um, and uh, when I go there, I actually am able to pay, you know, yeah. Even for instance, if I drink a glass of juice, let's say, right? I'm able to pay using, you know, Paytm there as well. Um, so yes, it actually the penetration because the mobile penetration, you know, in 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 India has actually increased so much. And what happens is now, you know, people are seeing on YouTube, um, you know, what 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 others are doing, and especially during COVID, a lot of this accelerated because you know people were not able to sell their products, you know, physically. So they, many of them actually created online, you know, um, to be able to sell. For instance, my, you know, just to give one an anecdotal example, my wife during COVID ordered these, you know, these what are called rajais. These are basically like, think, you know, these are uh, like blankets. So you know, uh, um, I forget the name. I mean, it's been 15 years since I left the United States. So I forget the jargon for here. I think uh, you get these in Target. Those um, comforters. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, comforters. Actually, you know, uh, whenever I get this, forget this term, I ask my wife, she has a much better memory of these things. So, yes, comforters. You go to Target, you get these comforters, right? So, um, so my wife ordered these comforters, actually, and these are nicely hand-stitched kind of things from, you know, from uh, uh, Rajasthan. Okay, you know, it's famous. And it's from a, actually, if I remember, it's either it was either from Jaipur or Udaipur, you know. In, and during COVID, sitting, you know, in the comfort of the home in Hyderabad, it, you know, she ordered basically because, and she was able to go on the, you know, uh, on the website, take a look at all the, the, pro, the pictures were there and, you know, and take a look and order that and actually they were delivered as well, you know, uh, like that, for instance, you know, it, it, many things, if, if you, you know, dresses, you know, Lucknow chickens, for instance, right, you know, uh, you, you can sitting, uh, sit and order, so there are producers sitting not in these you know, big metros who are actually doing that as well. And these are the, generally the, the sort of the younger entrepreneurs 
who knew that you know this is something if i have to survive during covid i have to actually go online and that is why they did as well so that has helped a lot in the increase in the you know uh, in, in digitization uh, it started with demonetization uh, but it has accelerated a lot you know during um, you know during uh, and you know i i'll 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 sort of on a on a side note i'll sh you know share um, as you know as a ca during covid I was so thankful that so much of digitization happened because just imagine if we actually had to give money to people, you know, with them lining up, you know, in queues, uh, you know, to get cash, basically, let's say for, I mean, kind of super spreader event that would have been, um, you know, during the during the first wave. And I was, you know, I, I, I was seeing what the United States was doing and chuckling to myself, actually, wow, you know. In the United States, how it was basically Trump, you know, had to sign checks. Basically, there were physical checks that were actually printed. Yeah. These checks had to be put into, you know, the United States Post Office envelopes. Those envelopes were, you know, delivered. It basically people got it on their through the post office, opened those, went into the, you know, the ATMs, deposited it, and then they had to withdraw cash. So six steps, and you know, sitting in India, basically, there's one click of the button, boom. You know, um, th that that that's how you know uh, it, it it got done. So that's the kind of digitization that 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 that, that has happened. Um, and you know, I, I I think extremely thankful we are because that I mean if we if we had to do that with these, these kind of physical things, right? You know, I think in a population of 1.4 billion with the kind of population density that we have, you know, I mean it would have been a nightmare um, managing. Um. Okay, so yeah. On the graph earlier, thank yes. you so much for speaking to us, by the way. So um, in terms of the growth rate of the rural per capita credit post the implementation of these bank account reforms and digitization, do you see like a substantial increase in that growth rate? Because I know it does yeah, seem so Yeah, no, it low. doesn't seem like, no, it's not actually, I, I, that's a good question. I would think that, so, you know, because the scale is actually to the urban, this thing, right? So right. I think there is some acceleration post 2014. So if we just look at this line, you know, just independently, I think right. you may see, but I have to check. I, I know that'll be speculation. I don't, I haven't checked it in the data, yeah. but it's a good question. I actually will, you know, I'll go and check it in the data. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Do we know or have the data for how much of this urban credit is distributed between, say, like MSMEs versus like industrialists? Because Oh yeah, good question. So actually, in fact, you know, um, MSME credit up until COVID was actually declining. You know, um, proportion of credit that was going to MSMEs was declining, uh, and large corporates were getting far more. Um, but it's only after COVID, and especially one of the schemes that we introduced during COVID was, you know, the the emergency credit scheme. You know, with with a, with a credit guarantee from the government. That is actually so. What was basically like a flat has now started going up substantially. In fact, you know, last year, and I was looking at this. Um, I was doing interviews. You know, during, after, after the union budget um, and one of the uh, things that has been done actually is for you know credit to MSMEs because it's expended has been extended in this year's budget you know this year month on month every month if you see the ex the increase in you know the growth rate of cre increase in credit to MSMEs is 30.5 percent 35.5 percent you know and 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 that's why these that scheme has been extended because it's been a you know it's been a wildly successful scheme you know uh, that that we had designed during during COVID uh, the, the the credit guarantee too, and it was focused only on small and medium enterprises, SMEs, and and, and MSMEs. Um, and it, yes, actually, you're absolutely right that from if you start seeing from 1990s onwards, it was in a continually declining as a proportion, not the absolute number, but the proportion. But it has now started increasing, you know, uh, spectacularly. Yeah. So if we focus on things like. Um Kind of giving credit to these companies, right? Yeah. How do we make sure that we go about that without this issue of like picking winners? There was like an Economist article today about it, so I'm curious your thoughts on that. Like, like, See, yeah. but you know, I mean, credit itself, bankers um, are prone to picking winners, uh, and I think in some sense, um, uh, if you think about capitalism itself, you know, in in, in the market, you know, when, when there is competition. The winners basically end up winning, and the losers have to have to get out. And that is a that is an aspect of it. As we were discussing earlier as well, you know, the fact that winners get to stay basically creates a, the incentive for you to work hard to win, um, and and which you cannot you know sort of uh, do away with. Um, um, so I think there will be some part of that. But what I'm you know, um, I think in India, I guess the this this um, you know this phenomenon of picking winners, but. 
not necessarily meritorious winners in terms of you know on you know in terms of credit credit at least i think um, it, it's it's often been far more connected winners you know who are basically they are the ones that have ended up getting and that related to the question that you know um, uh, um, was was asked on sme versus large corporates for instance this entire crony lending thing that happened up until 2014 that is actually just you know picking connected you know winners right not meritorious winners um, and 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 uh, with data now you know i think that can be corrected so in fact that's one of the key points in our book which you basically say is that you know give credit to the meritorious winners or those that actually have the potential to be meritorious winners um, and i think now with the data that is possible you know um, it, you know and 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 uh, not to the not to the connected winners uh, necessarily okay uh, yeah, you have anybody else has a question? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, sure. I mean, you you've you've talked a lot about the sort of the importance of credit in growth, which is which is obviously you know hard to deny. Um, how is the government sort of given given that there's been a slowdown in credit at least until COVID with the whole NBFC crisis? How is a the government looking to you know how do you sort of balance out you know maybe a necessary bailout of some financial intermediaries with sort of the allegations of corruption or sort of cronyism? How do you how do you sort of fix this problem once while ensuring that we won't have an NBFC 2.0 down the line? So firstly, you know, um, on the uh, banking sector, right, um, the um, recapitalization of the public sector banks, and this was one of the key things that happened during my tenure, the, you know, the, the clean up of the banking sector. Uh, yeah. In fact, you know, uh, you, you referred to the NBFC crisis, the NBFC crisis itself was actually an outcome of the banking sector crisis because you know what happened was this is how this is why you know um, you don't mess around with the with the banking sector because the overhang from that you know is just very 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 long um, there's a paper by uh, amir sufi at uh, university of chicago and atif mia at, at princeton um, which basically you know shows this there are also imf working papers that show that you know um, when you when you have problems in the financial sector, the overhang from that is very very long. Uh, why does that happen? Because and this this played out in textbook style in India, which is that you know initially you basically do a lot of crony lending. These cronies don't repay, yeah. uh, and you know what do you do? You basically uh, you evergreen those loans, and you know that is where the, the banking sector regulator should have basically clamped down and said you know show me your books and basically and you know clean up the books but it did happen um, so you know evergreening is basically ending, ending up you know just giving back giving more money to just hide the fact that the, the guy has not repaid the loan right so the evergreen um, and so as a result what is happening credit is being deployed to actually those that are deserving yeah so you, you evergreen and then you also then lend to zombies those basically not growing at all you know they end up uh, and, and that of course doesn't result in any output uh, output gain right so you know GDP growth suffers as a result of that uh, then what you happen is what happens is so I mean by the recapitalization should have happened ideally in you know in in 2014 happens in 2017 um, you know and then uh, by this time so the patient that actually uh, when I talk I'm talking about the patient the public sector banks which needed a, a single bypass in 2014 you kept putting band-aid on them you know for three years now in 2017 needs a quadruple bypass yes. um, you know and, and so you so you basically have to do the you do the quadruple bypass and then because there's been a lot of crony lending some you know there has to be some 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 consequences of that bankers basically become the victim some bank some bankers are jailed um, and you know and, and and sort of criminal procedures etc started uh, and, and that is no different you know it basically happens with you know in 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 united states and other countries too uh, and so what does what happens now there's a lot of risk aversion yeah. ba bankers don't want to lend because you know I mean, the, the way the incentives work is that they basically, if they take on risk, the credit risk, you know, they have no reward from that. But if they, you know, there is actually a lot of penalty from that. So, you know, credit basically, so when I took over as a CA, credit creation basically slowed down to a trickle. Uh, it, because bank, banking, banks stopped lending, NBFCs moved in there. And NBFC started lending without actually saying there's no tomorrow, as if there's no tomorrow. And then that back that comes back to bite again. We have the NBFC crisis, and then we actually have this. So this is how the overhang of the financial sector problems actually pro proceeds all along, which is why you know if you look at the 2020 Economic Survey Volume Two, you know actually had a full analysis of the slowdown because there was a lot of commentary at that time which was saying two things: one, you know, there's maybe something something structurally wrong with the Indian economy that now you know Indian economy is 
we will grow only at four and a half five percent that high growth of seven percent etc is gone that was one of the commentary that was being second commentary was that the slowdown is because of demonetization gst um, you know there's a paper in the quarterly journal of economics by my, my current colleague Gita Gopinath and her co-authors basically go and look for you know at the macro level you know what happened to growth as a result of demonetization and gst implementation they find nothing you know, there's no no impact actually, and that's why we, if you go and read the the uh, you know economic survey, basically it is because of the impact of the financial sector problems. You know, one after the other, the way actually had this cascading effect. That's what led to the continue, complete slowdown, and that is why you know there is if there's no nothing structurally wrong because if it were the case that the implementation of demonetization or GST etc led to some structural problems and therefore the economy was you know had to be content with four and a half five percent growth, you wouldn't be having five seven percent growth you know this this year and I'm, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah. So so I think that, that this is sort of a full you know a sort of uh, uh, in some sense cascade of the problems that you talked about in the yeah. financial sector. You know, uh, when you have public sector banks, um, some of this I think is inevitable. Um, you know, you but um, many people will say, "Oh, privatize all of them." Um, my my pushback on that, you know, yes, I've in fact pushed on privatization. You know, so there's the budget announcements have happened as well. But at the same time, you know, take the United States here. Actually, all banks are we're all private. It's not as if the global financial crisis happened because of you know banks that were actually owned by the government here. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily that the, the 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 essential element in all this is governance. You know, and bad governance can happen actually in private sector banks, as has happened in Yes Bank in India, for instance, and can happen with you know with with uh, government-owned banks as well. So I am not quite. I wouldn't go this you know saying you know all of the all of public sector banking is actually leads to bailouts and cronyism etc there's enough cronyism that can happen actually and cronyism happens even here in, in this country too it's not as if this country is actually you know is is, is devoid of, of 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 that stuff you know and, and research shows that too so so is there a, is there sort of a with with the, with these lessons learned is there a sort of a new regulatory framework some sort of new approach that is being the, the, so one thing actually so this is uh, the quote unquote telephone banking that was happening, you know, up until 2014. That's basically stopped. You know, now banks, banks have, you know, have the have the independence to go and give the loans, you know, the way they they they, they prefer uh, okay. on their make business decisions. Basically, um, it is possible that some bankers may think that, oh, if I actually end up giving lo a loan to X, I may actually look good to the you know powers that be. That if you know if 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 a banker actually thinks along those lines. I think that can't be even even without a phone call. If basically the banker thinks, "Well, I'm going to aggrandize myself," you know, to the to the powers that be by doing things that may actually please them, yeah. you know, that kind of thing actually that can happen even in the private sector banks as well. So that can't be ruled out. And I think that 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 that, that mechanism, I don't think there is actually a way of uh, apart from basically boards, you know, bank boards really being you know not asleep at the wheel and really you know uh, looking at all this. So to some extent, you think that we are always. Always inevitably going to be at some risk of you know misleading every, and therefore every country, country. Every country, not just you know, it's uh, I, I, that's not just characteristic of India. You know, the possibility of bad governance um, is, exists everywhere. I mean, look at look at what's happening here in the United States. You know, historically inflation that was actually supposed to be two percent. You know, inflation eight uh, percent, and why? Because it was actually you know pe people who were studying at the University of Chicago, and I'm sure Yale basically got five thousand dollar checks, right? I'm sure you guys are actually you know in private universities paying you know good good. You don't need that. You didn't need that five thousand dollar check, and what is that? That is bad governance. You know, um, the, I don't think there's actually any insurance against bad governance in any country. Okay. So let me. Uh, how much time do we have? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. We can break for uh, informal questions after. Yeah, we can do that. I've, so let me just quickly, you know, um, I, I talk about. I've, I've alluded to this already. So this is based on an article that I that 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 I wrote in the Times of India, um, um, you know, in September. So <clears throat> what is being plotted here? And this is, you know, uh, about growth prospects, uh, India's growth prospects. What is being plotted here on the x-axis is the change in inflation. You know, the inflation that has been there over the last one year. You know, compared to historical inflation in these countries from 1960 to 2020, so inflation here is basically as a multiple of historical inflation from 1960 to 2020, and that's why you see 50 percent, 100 percent, 150 percent, 400 percent, etc. So 100 percent means that the inflation this year, I mean, is basically the same as the historical average. 
400% means that inflation was four times the historical average. Um, and what you see on the y-axis is growth rate over a three-year period. Why three-year period? Because looking at the, now during the pandemic, growth slowed down and then came back actually. And that is why, you know, looking gro at growth. Um, so what do you see here? This is done for the top economies. Um, uh, uh, and what you see here is all these countries lining up on a very neat, you know, something that you asked actually at the, right at the start, right? You know, but with, with two significant outliers actually where now, uh, India and Germany, I'll come to that in a minute. But if you look at this, you know, uh, a very strong correlation between change in inflation and three-year growth rate. Why? This basically says that the growth rate, the three-year growth rate, you know, starting from COVID up until, you know, this year is primarily because of the money printing that happened in these countries. And that is what, so the growth rate basically was the benefit, but the inflation that you see today is basically the outcome of that. Um, and, and this is what you see here. Now, I'm not, I have no interest in talking about Germany because the talk on India, uh, I want to focus on the positive outlier that you see there, which is actually being marked in, in green there. Uh, now, if you look at India, actually, India's inflation, you know, has not been, uh, in fact, you know, when this was written, this was actually for the data for the first quarter, which is ending June of, of you know, 2022. Since then, inflation is, of course, you know, has, has, has cooled down. Uh, inflation at, up until that time was basically the same as the historical average. And yet growth rate is basically of the highest among these countries. Why is that the case? Because India was the only country to identify, you know, in between March to May 2020, and I was involved there actually, and so I can say it, you know, uh, with, with, with conviction, that we were the only country which identified that COVID is not like any of the previous crises. Whether it was global financial crisis or Asian crisis or the Russian, you know, uh, crisis, which were primarily demand side shocks, but COVID was also going to be a supply side shock. Why? Because in no other crisis was it the case that government said, hey, people sit at home. No, in no crisis, you know, did government say, the people sit at home, they're basically not going to produce, you know, to their factories, etc. Obviously, production will go down. If production goes down and, you know, there'll be supply chains that will be disrupted. Now, you know, many policymakers have actually recognized that supply chains, you know, are, are being disrupted. But we were actually the, you know, the only country to recognize in, you know, early, early, you know, March to May 2000. In fact, that was, that's why we were the last to come up with the COVID, policy, COVID package because we actually were thinking through what is the, you know, what was the crisis. And that is why we actually implemented supply side measures as well, not just demand side measures. Each of these countries did only demand side measures, just printed checks. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take questions. Let me just finish up, you know, this thought. Uh, there, in, there are, you know, um, in the 2020-21 economic survey, there is actually these uh, supply side measures have been talked about in detail. Uh, and, you know, on the demand side as well, and the, the, the constraint that we faced at that time was our credit rating was, you know, was basically just one notch. You know, uh, uh, if it went down one notch, we would have been non-investment grade. Um, you know, we, and if it were non-investment grade, pension funds, insurance companies, everybody would basically pull money out because they are not mandated to invest, you know, unless it is investment grade. So we had to be very, very careful, prudent in our spending as well. We didn't have the reserve dollar as a reserve currency to be able to spend like, you know, there's no tomorrow, nor did we actually have the comfort of a, of a credit rating saying, oh, even if we spend more, actually one notch credit rating goes down, it's fine money, there won't be any capital flight. But we had, and that is why we had to spend very, very prudently, which we did by designing, you know, a, one of the key things that we did was basically for 800 million people, by far the biggest, you know, uh, uh, program, food, food program, actually 800 million people, free food was given, but there was no fiscal cost out of that. Why? Because this was food that was already procured in previous years, was sitting in the godowns of the Food Corporation of India, and we just took that out and basically gave it as, you know, apart from that, the, the guarantee scheme, etc. And, and the capital expenditure driven growth. The focus on, if you look at the 2021 budget, from that last, you know, to the last year's budget and this year's budget, the increase in capital expenditure has been on average about 35%. And, and that is the big change in, you know, in fiscal policy as a result of it. So I'll, I'll just end with quickly, you know, this is something that you all, you know, um, I just want to explain conceptually. If you have a demand side shock and a supply side shock, you know, this is Econ 101, uh, what happens is what, you know, if suppose countries did nothing, right, which is there was, 
what you would have is basically quantity would decline significantly and our GDP growth would be very low, but there wouldn't be inflation because price would remain the same. Both the demand shrink and the supply. What countries did actually, you know, was they, they pushed back demand by actually printing money, you know, demand side policies. As a result, we were able to arrest the growth, you know, the growth the decline was obviously, uh, you know, was lower, but that's what has fueled, fueled inflation now, which is what I just showed you. What India did was not only will we, did we do this, but we also worked on the supply side. So increased demand and also supply, and that is why we've actually gotten a bigger kick on growth, and at the same time, inflation has not been as high. That's the reason why actually this was thought through, and you know, it's not an accident of, of uh, so the, you know, the prognosis, and I just want to, uh, this sort of, uh, 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 it's covered in, uh, in, in other places, but I'll just spend a couple, you know, just a minute on the economic vision, focused on growth at the macro level, together with efficient welfare, through use of technology to reduce basically some of the inequality. Uh, ethical wealth creation as basically, uh, you know, an important tool for, for, for prosperity, and the virtuous cycle starting, in, starting from private investment, you know, through, uh, uh, through, through the public capex. Um, so that's basically what, so um, to summarize, uh, you know, if, if you look at the growth versus inequality, uh, in India, you know, I am not convinced, and actually I showed you a ton of evidence, hopefully, at least I've been able to actually, if not convinced, I actually have made you think about the fact that, you know, there may not be, what you see in the advanced economies cannot be cut pasted onto, onto India, uh, and that, you know, uh, but I am convinced, and actually that's how, you know, uh, the, the, some of the conviction is actually is, is, is there, uh, you know, with the powers that be as well, that's the absolute, you know, cl clarity and objectives, which is growth, focus on growth at the macro level, um, you know, incidentally, you know, the last time there was a cap the, the cabinet reshuffle, the hashtag that was going around in social media was basically government for growth. You know, when I looked at that hashtag, I actually said, good, you know, this is basically something. So growth, focus on growth at the macro level, efficient welfare at the micro level. India must maintain laser-like focus on both to enhance socioeconomic outcomes not get sidetracked side by discussions about conflict between growth and inequality in advanced economies, avoid cut-pasting stuff that basically happens in advanced economies, think for yourself what is right, you know, because we are at a different stage of growth, advanced economies are at a different stage of growth, and evidence shows that growth reduces poverty sharply in India. I think India, India's economic policy post-COVID clearly focused on growth combined with efficient welfare, and therefore, this, I have, I've said this, those of you who might have tracked my media interactions, you know, even when everybody else was saying that there is something structurally wrong with the Indian economy, I was happy going on one leg, was the only person saying there's nothing wrong with the Indian economy, we will basically get out there, you know, we'll come back to growth and, um, you know, elsewhere said as well that this decade India will grow at 7% plus, you know, and, and uh, I can't see beyond this decade, I can't say anything, but this decade, some of the measures that we've put in actually will ensure that we'll grow at seven, you know, seven percent, uh, close to seven percent. This, this, and India will be the growth engine for the world economy. I'll stop there. Uh, John, Lee, thank you, Professor Ramanian, for that fantastic, wonderfully insightful talk. Um, if you're interested in SPF events, we have a mailing list on our website. We have a career fair next week on in, in jobs and careers in international development. Uh, on the 24th of February, we have Professor Harjun Shah from the SOAS joining us to talk about edible economics and his new book. And finally, we have Professor Branko Milanovic to, for the second part of our Inequality and Growth series coming in in the first week of March. Thank you very much for joining us, and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you.